Hello, my name is Farka Benkert. I'm an assistant professor of history at the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies here at Arizona State University. And today I'm going to talk about the Bosnian genocide. And what I want to do with you is, is just to give you a few themes that I think are important for uh, the Bosnian genocide, but uh, also offering comparative avenues to compare Bosnia to other genocides. So first I'm going to talk about ethno-nationalism and particularly this kind of ideas of a greater Serbia that are at play here, uh, promoted by ruthless leaders such as Slobodan Milosevic. And of course that is reminiscent of ideas of kind of a greater Germany uh, to be built uh, at the expulsion and eventual murder of others uh, as proposed by, by Hitler and, and others. Then I'm gonna talk about the relationship between war and ethnic cleansing. I'm gonna show that the country has been at war for quite some time and that these ideas of ethno-nationalism and, and creating a greater Serbia then translate into ethnic cleansing. Um, and uh, then the next point that I wanna make on the basis of Norman Neymark's work is uh, to show the link between ethnic cleansing and genocide. I'm not arguing that war, ethnic cleansing and genocide are always um, together, but I think that uh, here in this case, we see this kind of clear succession uh, of one into another. Lastly, a word on Western intervention and uh, its, its failure, at least initially, and uh, justice, which is of course another comparative avenue. We can see different forms of justice after a host of different uh, genocide, but here the International Tribunal on Yugoslavia and the corresponding tribunal on Rwanda really set new um, standards. I wanna close with an uh, to give you some resources, some, some websites for primary sources, as well as um, some uh, secondary literature uh, that you might find helpful. So uh, before we start, let me just give you a brief outline of, of Yugoslavia uh, before its breakup um, and uh, Yugoslavia after World War II is uh, conceived as a kind of a, um, in six republics um, um, uh, to the very north, Slovenia, then Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Montenegro, Macedonia, and Serbia, the largest um, uh, um, uh, by population um, republic within uh, you know, Yugoslavia. Um, Serbia itself it has two autonomous regions, the Vojvodina and Kosovo. Uh, we're going to talk about them a little in a little while. But what is important here is that um, Serbia starts to, or Serbians feel that uh, they're starting to lose their grip on these uh, autonomous regions. They're autonomous for good reason because they're inhabited by uh, of lots of other people. In Kosovo, that is uh, particularly pronounced, uh, those Serbs look at Kosovo as the kind of cultural and historical heartland of Serbia, it was mostly inhabited by Kosovo Albanians. Okay, so this is Yugoslavia. It's, it's six uh, republics within, uh, within Yugoslavia. And let me get to the fourth point, ethno-nationalism and leadership. And here I'm, I'm, I'm uh, in debt to the work of Michael Ignatiev, a very famous uh, um, Canadian uh, scholar and uh, politician, actually. And uh, um, of course, when we look at Yugoslavia uh, before its breakup, it was mostly held together by the charisma of Tito, who uh, emerged as kind of as a partisan leader against the Germans, um, but also as someone who could bridge the kind of ethnic tensions between the different uh, um, republics. His death in 1980, really was an incision that we probably didn't understand at the time, uh, but it meant that the thin veneer of communism, the thin veneer of a kind of a, a common victory in World War II, then a common identity as, a, as, a, uh, as Yugoslavia, the common identity as, of communism, the common identity of a kind of a third way form of communism that was much more open than Eastern Europe um, uh, to the West. Um, that thin veneer eroded very quickly with this death, especially after economic problems grew. And Serbia in particular found itself uh, in a very tight position because it's losing its grip on its two autonomous regions, Kosovo and Vojvodina, but also uh, on Yugoslavia in general. The Serbs were the largest group in Yugoslavia. It had dominated quite a number of government uh, um, positions and in the army. 
Uh, and particularly Kosovo is very important because it was literally seen as the cultural and historic heartland of Serbia. Uh, even today, there's a host of, of Orthodox monasteries in Serbia that are really the kind of uh, places of the heritage of the Serbs. It was also the place of history, um, not just culture. Um, on Kosovo Polia, an important battle was fought uh, um, uh, against uh, the Serbs, uh, between the Ottomans and the Serbs. Ultimately, um, it's not clear whether this battle was lost or it was a draw, but the ultimate result was that uh, Serbia and uh, more generally the Balkans were subjugated under Ottoman rule. And uh, that was only stopped uh, much later in two sieges of, uh, of Vienna, uh, but the Balkans clearly came under Ottoman rule. Uh, and for the kind of Serb national soul that embedded a sense of being victimized um, uh, by others. And now with uh, um, you know, mostly uh, Kosovo Albanians living in Kosovo, uh, this place seemed very, very threatened. And the previously unknown um, uh, communist uh, Yugoslav bureaucrat by the name of Slobodan Milosevic used the celebration of the anniversary of this battle in 1989 as a stage to spew his kind of uh, ethno-nationalist language of being a victimized, uh, just as Serbs were victimized at this battle allegedly, uh, they are victimized today, not just in Kosovo, but in all places where Serbs are uh, one group of, of several, be that in Bosnia or be that in Ukraine. Um, and uh, that from this victimization stems the need and the legitimization to form a kind of a greater Serbia. So this ethno-nationalist fire was quite deliberately and for the personal ambition of people like Slobodan Milosevic uh, uh, started at Kosovo Polia in 1989 at a time of the disintegration of communism more generally in Eastern Europe, but clearly also in Yugoslavia. And that disintegration uh, found its kind of prominent example in Slovenia declared its independence from Yugoslavia, the very Northern uh, uh, Republic uh, of Yugoslavia. Uh, and, but what was interesting that Slovenian nationalism was much more close to the kind of nationalism we saw in the peaceful revolutions all over Eastern Europe, right? Poles had shed communism in 1989. Uh, Hungarians, East Germans had shed communism. There was an expression of a nationalism that oriented itself on a kind of a Western style democracy and a Western style market um, economy. And Slovenes were very much in this kind of um, uh, tradition and Western Europeans understood them in this kind of uh, tradition. However, that meant the disintegration of Yugoslavia and Yugoslavia led mostly by Serbs uh, responded by in a short lived war that ended in an agreement uh, and safeguarded Slovenian independence in the end. But the first response was war, and that was the first war of Yugoslav uh, um, um, succession. But it also was the, the uh, starting point for many other nationalist leaders to promote the independence of their respective republics, particularly in Croatia, Franjo Tuchman, where we did not see the kind of Slovene uh, um, for expression of nationalism, but here's um, Fanyu Tuchman, his Croat nationalism also dreamt of a kind of a greater Croatia, also had enormous problems with contested spaces, be that the Ukraine, the southern, a very southern part of uh, Croatia today, or be that uh, Bosnia. So this ethno kind of uh, nationalism that uh, Slobodan Milosevic kind of gave birth to and people like Fanyu Tuchman in Croatia also promoted rests on ideas of, of perpetual victimization. And hence the place Kosovo Polia, this, this medieval battle that ended a Serb medieval uh, state is the prime example of that. And the longtime New York Times uh, journalist and, and, and columnist, uh, uh, Roger Cohen, uh, put this very, very succinct, uh, succinctly in his book, uh, Sagas of Sarajevo, Hearts Grown Brutal, when he wrote the Serb, the perennial victim could not see himself as executioner. The Serb, as eternal liberator, could not see himself in, as enslaver. The Serb, as concentration camp survivor, could not see the concentration camps he built. 
And this phenomenon has been called in other contexts, subaltern genocide, right? The idea that uh, the perpetrators themselves legit legitimize their actions with reference to some real or alleged past uh, um, victimization of their own. Um, and that is particularly prominent here among Serbs, hence Kosovo Polio, uh, but also hence this idea that only a greater Serbia uh, could protect Serbs living outside of the borders of, of uh, Serbia. And as such, it is, it is very clear where the kind of uh, conflicts would happen. It would happen in those areas where Serbs are not uh, the, the majority, but live in multicultural spaces. The most multicultural of all spaces is the most colorful on this map showing uh, um, ethnic, um, uh, um, uh, Yugoslavia ethnically. Uh, it's from a historical atlas made by uh, Paul Magoshi, a, a very distinguished scholar. But you can see if you just look at Bosnia, right, you can see it because it is where the yellow dots for um, Serbs are particularly pronounced, the uh, Croats are particularly pronounced, um, kind of pink, and Kosovo um, uh, and Bosnian Muslims in, in light pink, and uh, Kosovo Albanians in green then in, in Kosovo, right? This is not, not a surprise here that these multicultural, multi-ethnic uh, um, uh, areas are uh, most prone to be the victim of these kind of ethno uh, nationalists. And this ethno nationalism then quickly turns into war. Yes, we could see that the war uh, uh, in Slovenia could be quelled relatively quickly within a month, also with the help of the European uh, community. Um, but uh, Slovenia is largely uh, ethnically homogenous. When we then look at Bosnia, this is very different. And I really like this character here by Walter Hanno, a German caricaturist, who depicted the German Secretary of State, uh, Genscher, looking on to this kind of hourglass as time ticks away in Yugoslavia, and the sand that comes from the disintegration of Yugoslavia morphs into graves. And clearly, the West, particularly the Europeans, looked on helplessly um, as the disintegration of Yugoslavia turned into uh, uh, war uh, and subsequently ethnic cleansing and genocide. And this uh, kind of connection between war and ethnic cleansing is, I think, very well described uh, by Benjamin Liedemann. Uh, but I want to draw your attention to the fact that this is a war uh, that uh, starts in 1991, but it continues um, um, all the way through, through 1995, flares up then again in, uh, in Kosovo later. So um, this is a war, this is a country that becomes very quickly accustomed to war. Uh, and yes, the Slovenian uh, War of Independence could be over in a month with uh, the Brioni Agreement brokered by the European community. But then Serb attention very quickly shifts if Slovenia is gone, but there's no Serbs living in, or few Serbs living in, in, in Slovenia, then let's turn to the places that are prone to be part of a greater Serbia. And the first part was the Ukraina, which is a, uh, contested by Croatia and Serbia. Uh, it's the Southern part of, of uh, Croatia today. Uh, and um, the United Nations inadvertently uh, fueled the fire because they did something that was very, very clear and, and right at the time uh, they banned the sale of arms to former Yugoslavia. Of course, you, you want to take the fuel out of the fire and you don't want to add fuel by selling arms. But inadvertently, the United Nations thus gave uh, the upper hand to the group that has the most arms already, and that's the group that inherited the arsenals of the former Yugoslav army, for the most part, the Serbs. As a, as a result, the Serbs quickly won the struggle with uh, Croatia about the Krajina, and they then took the Krajina as well as some other Croatian territory uh, already in 1991. And the United Nations then brokered a peace there, uh, and inadvertently, again, uh, they favored the Serbs because the peace was brokered at a time when, with uh, enormous uh, Serb um, territorial gain. And the peace then acknowledged these territorial uh, gains. Only later did the Serbs, with the blessing of the United Nations, 
then uh, change these borders again. Now, but having secured some kind of peace uh, against Croatia uh, um, on the Krajina, very much to their own terms, the Serbs then quickly turned their attention to the next puzzle piece of a greater Serbia. Where else are large parts of Serbs living not in, within the borders of, of Serbia? And that is Bosnia. Uh, and Bosnia too declared its independence, though later in 1992. But the Serbs boycotted the referendum uh, and that gave them license in their view to declare uh, uh, the Bosnian parts of Serbia, of uh, the, the, the Serb dominated parts of, of Bosnia, their own republic, the Republika Srpska. Uh, Radovan Kajic then emerged as president of, of this part, but very quickly the idea became that uh, war in Bosnia would merge into ethnic cleansing to create an ethnically uh, Serb. Uh, entirely ethnic um, uh, um, uh, um, Serb um, enclave in Bosnia. And here again, I think it's, it's very important, right? War, uh, and I'm quoting Benjamin Lieberman here, war itself and the fear of injury and death propelled civilians to gather their belongings, leave cities, towns, and villages under attack, right? That is the result of war. It is almost inevitable. But, and he goes on, ethnic cleansing was not simply an effect of war. In campaigns of ethnic cleansing, the forces entered into mixed communities and regions made driving out unwanted populations the, a prime goal of violence. And this is exactly what happened in Bosnia, right? The war was not only a conflict over territory, but for the Serbs, it was uh, a conflict over territory that should be ethnically uh, Serb only. And as such, very quickly, it morphed into ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing, and here I'm relying on the work of Selma Ledesdorf, uh, surviving the Bosnian genocide, the women of Srebrenica speak, um, who interviewed um, uh, um, female survivors um, of the Bosnian genocide and of sexual violence, who made the argument that um, rape, sexual violence was a part a tool of ethnic cleansing. It was not a byproduct. It was not a, an unintended consequence. It was not a crime that just happened in, in the fog of war. It was a part of this war. It was a part of ethnic cleansing designed to drive out uh, um, Bosniaks, particularly uh, Muslim um, uh, uh, Bosnians. And she goes on to point out that this is a, a, not only a very heinous crime, but it is also a crime that is very, very difficult to prosecute because of the stigma around it, because uh, testimony is very hard to gather, though she did uh, gather a lot of uh, testimony, much to her credit. So as such, right, uh, it is part and parcel of, of, of ethnic cleansing. It's not a kind of a, uh, um, uh, it's just a very heinous part of, the, of this, and it is very, very difficult to prosecute. So in what we see here is the kind of uh, images that show this progression, right? The war in Bosnia is signified by the burning executive council building in Sarajevo here on the very, very left of the, of the screen. That was set on fire by artillery fire of Serbs from positions surrounding Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia. Uh, and you know, Sarajevo is always a kind of a multicultural uh, city. Uh, it hosted Olympic Games, um, uh, it, you know, putting this parliament building on, on, uh, on, on fire is, is, is a symbol uh, of the kind of ruthlessness of this war. Uh, but it's also the breaking up of bridges between communities that had been at war for many years, but also communities that had lots of ties, lots of intermarriage, lots of uh, cultural ties with each other. And particularly telling of the kind of destroying of these bridges is the destruction of the old bridge Stari Most in Mosta, uh, Bosnian. Uh, the bridge linked uh, Bosniak and Croats parts of the town. It was destroyed in 1992. It's now restructured. It's a World Heritage Site, actually. Uh, but um, it, is, it is really so telling to destroy this bridge, just as telling as it is now to rebuild that bridge. 
And on the bottom is, is uh, an image of the gravestones at um, the uh, um, a genocide memorial near Srebrenica, right? So war, the breaking of old ties and genocide here progress very quickly in Bosnia. So from ethnic cleansing to genocide, um, that is yet another step. And here I'm relying on the work of Norman uh, Neymark who wrote, uh, and I quote, genocide is the intentional killing off of a part or all of an ethnic uh, religious um, or national group. The murder of a people or peoples is the objective. The intention of ethnic cleansing is to remove a people or often all traces of them from a concrete territory. So here we see two different things, right? Killing and removal. But as he himself concedes, this distinction isn't so easy. He goes on to say, at one extreme of its spectrum, ethnic cleansing is closer to forced deportation or what has been called population transfer. The idea is to get people to move and the means are meant to be legal or semi-legal. And that in itself is, is very problematic if I may interfere here, um, because even if we look at uh, you know, um, other instances of forced population transfer, they often go uh, are accompanied with, with ruthless violence, right? Uh, this is a forced uh, intervention. Uh, the means are often uh, ruthless and violence is necessarily uh, the result of that. Nonetheless, and I quote, uh, continue to quote from him, the idea is to get people to move and the means are meant to be legal or semi-legal. At the other extreme, however, ethnic cleansing and genocide are indistinguishable only by the ultimate intent. Right? Uh, in this sense, right, he's acknowledging that uh, ethnic cleansing and genocide, it's only the intent to remove or to kill that, um, that distinguishes them. But at the end of the day, right, ethnic cleansing in itself is very, very often accompanied by gratuitous violence and not seldomly then morphs into genocide. And this is exactly what we see in Bosnia where ethnic cleansing uh, um, was accompanied by gratuitous violence, and then it morphed into genocide, particularly in places such as Sepanica. And as a result of that, uh, the International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia tried ethnic cleansing as a war crime, but it also reserved a special category of genocide charges um, that it also prosecuted. And in the trial of uh, the former Bosnian Serb leader, Radovan Karadzic, uh, the charge of genocide was successfully applied to Srebrenica, uh, and he was convicted um, for um, uh, genocide uh, in, in Srebrenica. Now, let's briefly talk about Western interventions. Um, the uh, US Ambassador Zimmerman, the last uh, American ambassador to uh, Yugoslavia, in his very last cable from Belgrade, uh, said it very succinctly. He said, it was not nationalism, or ethnic or religious hatred, or the collapse of communism that were the direct uh, causes of uh, the violence. The breakup of Yugoslavia, he argues, was caused by villainous leaders, uh, and particularly Milosevic and Tuchman, who used nationalism to promote themselves. Um, so, right, we come back to the, the first point of, the, of, the, uh, of this presentation, ethnic nationalism and the ruthless ambitions of leaders such as Milosevic and Tuchman. But it was very, very difficult for the West to, to understand that. Um, and the United Nations in particular uh, played an ambiguous role. At first, they created safe havens in Bosnia, for example, in Srebrenica to safeguard uh, people against ethnic cleansing and the fear of, of uh, genocide. But the United Nations mandate was not very strong. This, uh, particularly the Dutch soldiers who happened to be stationed and guarding uh, Srebrenica were not endowed with a, with, a, with a strong mandate to defend themselves. And they were not equipped with the weapons they would have needed to defend themselves and the people in their care. Um, they thus abandoned their post um, and left the people under their care uh, to the genocide then committed uh, by um, the Serbs. They were harshly criticized 
um, for that, uh, particularly in the Netherlands. But uh, nonetheless, right, I mean, these Dutch soldiers just epitomized what the mandate are given by the United Nations allowed them to do. Now, uh, the United Nations, have also, however, um, under the leadership of NATO in this case, uh, kind of ended the war and quite literally bombed the Serbs to the negotiation table. And it was uh, Bill Clinton uh, who then managed to safeguard the Dayton Accords that created an independent Bosnia split uh, um, uh, with a split kind of government and rotating presidency between Bosniaks, um, uh, Serbs, and, and uh, Croatians. But the dream of, of uh, greater Serbia didn't end there. And of course, uh, Kosovo then was another example where NATO, NATO intervened to prevent ethnic cleansing uh, and uh, establish Kosovo as an independent nation. Um, but I think one of the most important uh, um, legacies of, of, of international intervention is of course the war crimes tribunal that tried Milosevic. He could not be sentenced, he died uh, standing trial and uh, Karadzic who was convicted. Um, and international responsibility doesn't end there. Uh, state building takes generations uh, and first NATO and then uh, uh, European Union troops uh, had to be engaged in peacekeeping missions in Bosnia, Kosovo, and Macedonia. Uh, and it's pretty clear that uh, you know, peacekeeping is one of the necessary preconditions for state building. And this is not to be achieved in a short period of time. This may well take uh, generations. So part of the kind of Western intervention is of course justice um, and the international tribunal did sentence this gentleman, uh, Radovan Karadzic uh, to life uh, for committing a genocide at uh, Srebrenica. But it is also clear that uh, only a handful of the perpetrators could ever be uh, indicted. So 161 individuals were indicted at this tribunal and in order to indict and, and uh, prosecute them uh, and sentence 90 of them, uh, you know, an enormous uh, number of witnesses had to be fielded, an enormous number of documents had to be compiled. Um, and uh, this took a very, very long time. Uh, this is necessary. This is important work. There is no question. However, um, it is also clear that this takes the prime uh, um, perpetrators and many, many, many others will go unpunished. So in this presentation, I, I led you through the kind of ethno-nationalism on the basis of, of uh, Michael Ignatieff's work and Tuchman and particularly Slobodan Milosevic for the Serbs are the prime example of this kind of ethno-nationalism. We then show, discussed how ethno-nationalism leads to, to war and to ethnic uh, cleansing on the basis of, of uh, Lieberman's work. Um, and then finally, we, we thought about ethno-nationalism and uh, ethnic cleansing and genocide on the basis of Norman Neymar's uh, work. And we see this progression of war, ethnic cleansing uh, to genocide. Lastly, we talked about the uh, you know, very difficult and ambiguous intervention, um, international interventions. And we talked about justice that uh, feel this enormous evidence uh, in these trials. But of course, uh, many, many perpetrators were not captured though, of course, particularly the trial of um, uh, Karadzic and his conviction for genocide was a major accomplishment of, of uh, the international tribunal. Now for teaching this, I think uh, it's important to point out these themes and give students uh, these or uh, pick others, but to use these themes and then think about how this might be present in other genocides uh, as well, right? Um, so that if you're discussing Bosnia, you can also you know, build bridges to the Holocaust or to other genocides who, which you might be discussing as well in, in your class. Um, the other thing that, that I think uh, you, you probably uh, will find helpful for, for your um, work is primary source collections. And the United States Holocaust Museum has a lot of documents on Bosnia as well under the link above. Uh, the Clinton administration, the Clinton Presidential Library has a lot of documents, American documents compiled information on uh, the um, 
uh, situation in former Yugoslavia, but of course also Bosnia in particular. And another thing that I think is, is really important for students to connect with is survivor testimony. Here's a website, a British website that has compiled a lot of survivor testimony. And more difficult to sift through are the international tribunal, tribunal documents uh, that are uh, largely published. And by the way, uh, the documents from the Nuremberg trials are published too. So in terms of comparative themes, you can really look at documents from both of these uh, uh, major trials. In terms of uh, bibliography, um, I wanna draw your attention to Hasan Hasanovich's uh, Voices from Srebrenica, Survivor Narratives, that is uh, very important to compile testimony. Equally in the same vein, uh, what I mentioned, Selma Ledesdorp's um, Surviving the Bosnian Genocide for a Female uh, Perspective. Um, I, think, I think in terms of testimony, these, these two books are, are uh, really uh, breathtaking, uh, quite literally, uh, um, uh, in, in what they say about uh, survivors and, and their narratives. Um, Paul uh, Bartrop's uh, reference guide is, is a very good overview that, that you find, uh, uh, that I'm sure you'll find helpful. Uh, and uh, uh, I also very quickly um, uh, uh, want to draw your attention to another, uh, it's not a book, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an article by Milena Stereo, The Courage of Genocide Conviction, uh, um, uh, Inferences, Intent, and the Necessary to Redefine Genocide. It came out with the Emory uh, International Law Review in 2017. But what's so important here is because uh, she spells out how the trial against Karadzic redefined uh, genocide uh, and moved a little away from the strong uh, definition on intent, right? That the intent has to be clear in order to prosecute someone on, uh, as genocide. And, you know, that language emerged, of course, from Rafa Lemkin's work and in terms of the Nazi intent to kill the Jews, that is clear, right? That's obvious, there's lots of documents that show that, but for courage, it just was much, much more difficult. And as such, you had to kind of infer from actions and documents compiled that this was the intent. Um, and the important uh, contribution of this trial in particular was that uh, genocide was, he was convicted of genocide, um, but uh, the judge allowed to infer the intent rather than to uh, really, uh, um, you know, uh, clearly prove it. Uh, and that is very, very important for how we think about genocide in the future because very few genocidal regimes leave um, uh, uh, documents uh, as the Nazis did that clearly show uh, their intent. So I hope uh, you will find this uh, helpful in terms of the themes that I outlined in terms of the primary sources that uh, you find here and in terms of the, of the literature. Thank you.